uh, welcome everyone. Um, we have a brief special uh, session today, and we'll we are live stream on Facebook uh, right now. Yes. So uh, hopefully there'll be lots of people joining us on Facebook uh, and maybe asking questions as well. We'll see uh, how we go. Um, before um, I talk a bit more, I'll invite uh, Diajot, uh, who's uh, our director of research. Uh, and the collection and research, and it's going to give us a, a bit of a, a welcome. Dai? Thanks, um, Kenny. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, and just before I begin, we'd like to acknowledge that we're actually meeting today on the, the um, lands of the Wajukamana people, uh, and would like to pay our respects to their elders uh, and their past, present, and future emerging leaders. So, welcome to you all. Uh, good to see you all. We've all found your way out here to Washpool, which is sometimes not the easiest place to get to. So Kenny's asked me to tell you a little bit about the museum and especially about our new museum project. So there on the left you'll see the conceptual... Oh, which one is it? This one there. Uh, this is a conceptual drawing of um, the artist's architect's review of what it will look like. It's actually beginning to look remarkably like that if you're in the city. It looks absolutely huge. It's four times larger than we actually had before. It fills, if you knew the old museum and the campus area, it fills the whole, the whole area now. The whole area is being built over, which means we've got four times more exhibition space. So altogether we've got over 6,000 square metres of exhibition space there. Uh, which includes a thousand square meter travelling exhibition um, area for big blockbusters. But it, the rest is for us to show off our collections. And of course, paleontology is going to be in one of those, in um, going to heavily, heavily feature in the wildlife gallery, especially. But all the, the all the galleries will be absolutely showing off what the treasures we actually have in this collection. We'll also have things like learning studios, which we've not had before, so we can get people to come in and actually learn about our collections or, or, or have educational themes which bring up our collections. We'll also have um, big areas for public interaction. It's a museum for the people, even though unfortunately at the moment we have to pay to go in, although we're still working on that one with the government and hoping that it will be a free museum for all the people. It'll also have, obviously, retail and cafe spaces. There is a, um, an animated flyby, uh, which you can look at. If you look at our main museum site, which is um, museumwa.gov.au, and you go on to New Museum, just underneath you'll see, you can click a button, and you can have a fly-through of the, the new building. Uh, it's obviously an artist's architect's rendition, but it's, it's pretty good. It gives you an idea of the size and the scope of what's happening in that building. So we're out here at the Collections and Research Centre. Uh, we moved out here in the early 2000s from the main site in the city, mainly because the, we were ironically the most modern building on that site, but it um, had a potential of having asbestos in it, which is why we came out here. So this was bought by the government, it's actually the Pimble factory, you know, time zone. This used to be their headquarters before they actually <laughs> went offshore. So this brick part of the building that we're in now and what we call the two sheds at the back were what we had. We had $15 million, most of that was spent on just retrofitting one of those buildings into um, good environmental conditions so that we can put our collections and I think Kenny will be taking you out there this afternoon to see that area but it's got the proper international standards for temperature and humidity. It's supposed to be pet it's pest free hopefully all the time. Uh, the other one is we didn't have any money to do anything with so basically that's where we have robust collections or it's a receivable area for, for things like that. The new part that you'll see, you saw as you came in here, um, is this building on the right here, which we've called the Harry Butler Research Centre. Uh, and when the new museum was being built, which was a $395 million project, I argued uh, 
vociferously and in the end uh, quite successfully to get $17.5 million so that we could have new wet store and collection, um, receivable collections and laboratory area here because we'd never had that when we came out to do our retrofitted building here. And consequently, we had terrible old makeshift labs and makeshift wet store that always had mould in it. And we were always threatened to be closed down by relevant authorities because we were breaking all the rules about monomark bottle and all this sort of stuff. So anyway, we, we built this facility and um, you'll probably see it this afternoon, but there are state-of-the-art laboratories. So we've gone from the sublime to the ridiculous, from something which was always going to be closed down to suddenly we've got these really state-of-the-art labs and receiving places where um, instead of sorting the specimens outside in the car park, we've actually got a space to sort them in now. Um, and just also we've got a wet store in now. I don't know if you'll go into the wet no, store. But that's got 10, that's again state-of-the-art. Uh, it's got 10 kilometres of shelving in it and it's got something like, I think it's 380,000 <coughs> bottles in there and something like 1.6 million specimens. So on the next slide, yes. okay. Yes. yes, that's right. So this this is, uh, and the compactors and these were all designed by our staff, so everybody's been very involved in that. So that's that's sort of, um, I think altogether in there, there are 2.5 million specimens I've got on here. It's called the Harry Butler Center because Harry Butler, um, who is, is of course a famed naturalist, used to actually worked for the museum in the early days of the museum and he was an education officer and then he became, when he became more famous and left the museum, he became a great benefactor for us who provided $10,000 every year for uh, um, people doing field work and things like that and so we, we've named it um, after him and he actually left us a large bequest in his will as well so he's been a marvellous benefactor for us. So these collections, um, we cover a huge number of areas. We have aquatic zoology, which covers all the things like mollusks, crustaceans, fishes, marine invertebrates, worms. We've got uh, terrestrial zoology, which obviously is mammals, snakes, lizards, frogs, insects, birds. Um, and then earth and planetary sciences, which are minerals, meteorites, invertebrates, invertebrate, pal uh, invertebrate and paleontology. As well as that, we have archaeology and anthropology and history and maritime history. That's all out here. Down in our Fremantle Museum, we have our maritime archaeology people and we have our um, historic shipwrecks collections and we also have our conservation labs. So we're a little bit spread out, but the aim is to eventually bring all of that onto this one site. So we've got all the collections and research staff and collections together. Now, our collections are used in a huge number of ways by different people, obviously the general public and um, researchers, but they're also used for things like planning, uh, for industrial resource and resource development, uh, environmental uh, monitoring and management, obviously heritage management, biosecurity. The new one now is bioprospecting, where uh, drug companies are interested in active active molecules from certain, you, quite often it's been from marine invertebrates as far as we're concerned and, and a lot from things like sponges or some of them are from little um, sluggy things called needle ramps. Uh, and at the moment um, there's some legislation going through Parliament that we've been very involved with getting through, which means that if a drug company finds active molecules that go through to get a drug, um, that goes onto the market, there's a benefit sharing arrangement so that the state gets a share and especially if it's on indigenous lands, indigenous people get a share of that, which hasn't been the case before when drug companies have just come in. Um, yeah, one of the examples is the, um, the, the one of the salt bushes which was found to have, when AIDS was around, um, there was a molecule in that that they thought would cure AIDS. And um, a student was caught smuggling 2.5 kilograms of that out of Australia at our Alice Springs, and he'd been paid for by one of the drug companies in the States. And if that had gone out, as it, as it turned out, it didn't have a, it did have a positive reaction, but it was too expensive to go.
go ahead and make a drug. But if that had gone ahead, all that revenue would have gone back to the states and, and not to Australia and not to the people on whose land it was being taken from. So we at the moment, um, there's a, um, a sponge, which is a West Australian sponge, which has proved positive for triple negative breast cancer. And so as soon as this legislation goes through, the people at Harry Perkins um, Institute who found this will be able to, to work and try and see if they take that through to some sort of drug stage. So that's one of the interesting things about our collections. We also get a lot of um, crime investigation collections are used in all sorts of different ways, or um, Mikhail's been looking at um, sharp, sharp indents of people when they've been bitten. Um, so there's, there's lots of things, and obviously films and documents. We also play, our collections play a big role in creating our sense of identity for WA and they're also a big drivers of tourism to and away and from and around WA and that's one of the big things about the new museum that we're hoping will be a big tourism boost. So I'm going to shut up now but I'm just yep. going to say that um, obviously the paleontology collection is going yep. to feature on it, you've got a slide on yep. that. So. <laughs> These are some of the wonders of our, our wonderful paleontology collection and I'm sure you're going to be looking at collections this afternoon and you're going to be here and Kenny's the guy to tell you about these things, not me, he knows a lot more about it. So, so I guess all I need to do is just wish you all a really good time and thank you all for coming out here and being here in this man's good hands. Thank you, Thank you very thank much. Sorry, it's not fresh. It's, it's okay. okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks. So we'll cut you. So I need to do the housekeeping before we uh, continue on. So I hope you found the toilets on the way. Uh, there's uh, male toilets on the kitchen side, just outside, and female toilets just as you get come out the door on the left. So it should be very easy to find the toilets if you need to use them. Emergency, same. If you get out this door, turn left, like sharp left. There's a, down the corridor, there's the emergency exit. We get down to the lower ground, and then uh, um, we go and walk all the way to the main gate where you came through, and that's where is the meeting point in case there's a fire. Hopefully there's no fire. Um, remember this is an office space. Oh. Kelly, can I just say, I forgot the most important thing to tell you, that in your collection, <laughs> you've got in our collection, we've got 1.5, more than 1.5 million vertebrates, which their value is 16 million US dollars. And our ter the total invert and this is in fossils, and your invertebrates are one, over 1 million, and their value is 32 million. So altogether, your value of your collection is probably 7 point one million dollars. Alright, so uh, these are of these spaces. If you need to take a phone call, um, if you can go to the kitchen area to take your phone call rather than sitting outside of someone's office, because uh, they get really uh, annoyed if there's someone talking on the phone outside their offices. Um, morning tea and afternoon tea will be serving the courtyard downstairs. We'll have our volunteers showing you uh, where to go. Uh, because it's kind of confusing to get through all the offices to get to the courtyard. So it's not going to be in that kitchen there, because the staff are using it uh, all throughout the day, and we don't want to uh, impact on other people working. Uh, so we'll show you how to get there. It's not too hard. Um, if there's some stairs, so if you don't want to use stairs, or we can't use stairs, there's another way to get uh, through with the elevator, and uh, we can show you how to do that. Volunteers. Um, <laughs> can I get all my volunteers to actually stand up and, and wave? They all have a pass like this, uh, so uh, I'm very lucky to have really good volunteers that are helping out all throughout the day. Uh, couldn't, this wouldn't have happened without them. So thank you very much, all the volunteers, for helping out. Um, and they're the people that are going to get you through the doors, because uh, everywhere there's a swap card access, and so you need to volunteer to actually get you through the doors. This afternoon we'll have tours. Uh, they're optional, so if you need to go, you can go uh, after afternoon tea. If you want to come and do other tours, there's two tours, one in the paleontology uh, collection with Mikkel and one uh, for the mammal collection with the, mam the fossil sorting as well with me. And to do that, you just have to put your name on one of those three groups. So at, at morning tea, just come up 
put your name down. It's limited spaces, so it's first come, first serve. And just want to remind you that our talks are eight minutes and with two minutes questions. Only the talks will be recorded, so the eight minutes. Uh, so to please try to keep to the time. We'll remind you at seven minutes that you've done seven minutes, so you get one minute left. So you can wrap up in that one minute. If you go a little bit over, it's okay, but uh, try to keep to time. Now, um, looking at the symposium at attendance, uh, we've got people from pretty much all the universities and uh, agencies uh, in WA, so it was really good. Um, and what's really uh, impressive is we have uh, pretty much uh, gender equality. So <laughs> that's yeah. really good. Um, so there's actually uh, 48 people, um, some, one person uh, signed up uh, yesterday. Uh, and the ratio for researchers to students is basically uh, two to one. So it's good to have a, a bit of uh, everyone. And I'll just remember this slide because I'll come I'm back to this story a bit later on. So I wanted to introduce you to AAP. So how many of you are actually members of AAP? A handful? Yeah, so it's pretty much the committee plus three people. Yeah. All right, so, <laughs> <laughs> so you may uh, know AAP as the Association of Australian Paleontology. That was that old name. Uh, because AAP is not separate from Geostic Science Australia, we had to change the name a few years back to Australasian Paleontology. We couldn't have the word association in the name. So now we just we kept AAP, even though that we have dropped the name. Um, but I guess it could be kept for Australia, <coughs> Australasian uh, paleontology. Um, so we are part of so, uh, Geo, uh, the Geological Society of Australia, um, and our current council is in WA. It changed every four years. So the previous council was in South Australia, and now uh, we've taken over in October last year. Uh, so it's myself. John uh, sitting over here, um, Heidi over here, and Dan at the back. So I'll literally give you a bit of an introduction about AAP. It's got a long history, uh, started in, uh, in the 60s. It actually is the fusion of two different societies. So the first society is the Queensland Financial Society. that will be founded uh, by Dorothy Hill and Jack Woods. So Dorothy Hill is uh, quite famous because she was our first uh, uh, professor in geology, first female uh, professor in geology and paleontology. So she started it for all uh, female uh, paleontologists, and she was the, the, the really the, the driver of uh, of uh, the society. She uh, actually uh, registered it. She did all the the groundwork really. And then a few years later, um, also uh, within GSA, there was a specialist group uh, that formed called paleontology and biostratigraphy. Um, so uh, th that was in 1964, that's in 1969, and they merged into one uh, society in 1974, but under a GSA. So we were actually not really a society, even though we called ourselves a Soviet society at that point. So we changed our name in 2015, uh, because then we actually not, it wasn't legal to actually be called association. We have three journals. Nomen Nudum, that cited first, uh, and it's just a new newsletter that uh, is published every year, where basically all the paleontologists around Australia can submit a little uh, bit about themselves, what they did that year. So I published three papers on, on conodonts that year, and so other paleontologists can know what they've been up to. You don't have to be a member to submit to this, you just have to ask to be uh, added to the mailing list, and usually in November you, uh, you get a reminder, please submit your your little contribution, and then it gets released in December or January. Our Turing guys are a uh, big journal. Uh, you're probably very familiar with that. Uh, published four times a year. Uh, and it used to be really all Australian paleontology uh, in there. Uh, but le lately, because universities are pushing uh, researchers to publish in higher ranked journals, unfortunately, there's less and less Australian paleontology published in Our uh, but it's quite international, there's papers from all around the world. The last one is for large monograph, the AAP memoirs. Uh, we have awards, they started, they started quite late, started the first awards in 2016, uh, that was at uh, Palio Dananda uh, in Adelaide. Uh, so the first recipient for the Robert Hetherich uh, Junior Medal uh, was Bruce Renegar 
And um, so this particular award is a Life Achievement Award. So it's meant to be for the best of the best uh, in paleontology. And so Tom Rich got it last year. And the second prize that we have is the Mary Wade Prize. Um, first one was given to Dr. Chris Mays and the second one to Dr. Uh, Stephen Poropat. And to get that prize, you have to publish in Archeringa and be an early career researcher. So there's strict, uh, strict rules to be able to get that prize. Um, the AAP has been in, uh, really uh, involved in a lot of conferences. There's not one th conference that AAP was actually part of. I uh, was specifically trying to do, uh, to be present at a lot of, uh, uh, of the geology conferences at, at early times, so NZAS and AGC. Uh, more recently, it's been involved with AGCC and, uh, and AESC. Re uh, what you can notice is actually it's never been involved with, with CAVAPS. So CAVAPS is the vertebrate paleontology, and it's always been uh, running uh, separately uh, with no involvement from AAP. Uh, and that's something that we want to look at to change because uh, AAP has been really uh, being on the geology side uh, and we'd like to make it for all paleontology, not just, uh, and I'm a ver vertebrate paleontologist, so I want to actually get that <laughs> on board. Um, and our true, so our first really uh, uh, true AAP conference is Paleo Down Under. So there was one uh, that was done early on and then it kind of died and it was revived by the um, Adelaide group in 2016, and we'll have the next one in Perth in 2022. So a little bit of about the, the membership of AAP. So it started in 1963 with the Queensland Financial Society. In 1969, um, that um, GSS uh, subgroup started, so numbers goes up. And by 74, they merge, and you can see then a spike. <coughs> so with the merger kind of brought the community together, and then uh, lots of people decided to join. And the golden years of paleontology is in the early 80s. That's when the society had 300 members, lots of, of research was uh, happening in paleontology uh, in the late 70s and early uh, 80s. So, and uh, since then, it's basically been uh, a, a slow uh, degrade. So I don't have the numbers from 88 to 2014, uh, but so the line is, 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 shouldn't be as steep as that, but it should be conti continuously decreasing uh, at a slow, steady rate. So I've got the numbers for uh, the last four years from the previous council. For some reason, I don't have the numbers from before that. Uh, I wanted to point out the difference between male and female uh, membership. We have very, very few female uh, members. And you've seen the, at the beginning the attendance, it's pretty much uh, gender equality there. So we really like to see gender equality also in the membership. Um, it's really an old boys club at the moment and we want to change that. Uh, so it's a paleontology for everyone. Uh, so the reason why this decline is actually probably uh, the fact that uh, to be part of AP, you have to be part of GSA as well. So you have to actually sign up to both. Uh, and a lot of people say it's a lot of money because you have to um, pay the memberships for a uh, for GSA, which is 175, and then you have to add on um, uh, uh, 40 dollars to be sorry. So here, uh, here we go. Paleontolo you have to actually sign up paleontology AAP 40 dollars. So it adds up. So a lot of people think, oh, it's too much money, and they don't actually sign up because they don't see a return for for their money. So we want to try and change this uh, as well. So like you feel like you want to be part of the society and you'll get something out of it. Um, but when you actually sign up on the GSA website, it's very confusing. There's 180 options. To <laughs> so a lot of people go, how do I sign up to AAP? So it's, there's two sections. One, you select the GSA part, uh, which was spend member with just a general member, 175. And then you have to look for the specialist group and it says paleontology, AAP, that's the one you need to click. If you don't click that, you're not, you're not gonna be a, you're just a member of GSA, not AAP. Um, we have a website, our official website has a very horrible uh, link to uh, this address. <laughs> so it's actually quite hard to find, but it's, it's under the specialist group on the GSA website and then you have to find AAP in the list. That's actually what it looks like, our web page. And it's got very minimal information. Um, the Adelaide group actually started a, a, another website, 
Uh, they started it for Paleo Dananda, and after Paleo Dananda finished, they tried to start to make it as a website for us, but uh, then they, uh, time um, finished. So we will try and tr uh, actually have a, a more detailed website eventually, uh, <coughs> but uh, we'll we need volunteers to help us with that because we're not very good with websites. Um, so if anyone actually has the skills and want to help out, uh, you'll be welcome to come out. Uh, we want to be the website to be really also a tool for paleontologists so they can find things. If you find a list of paleontologists, the areas they work in, because right now it's scattered everywhere. If you want to find a specialist in, in, in a group, it's really hard. You have to check all the websites from all the universities or the museums. Um, so we'd like to have a one-stop shop for that. Uh, we started the social media, so that started uh, only this year. So we've got a Facebook group, and uh, we're recording now on it. We've got a Twitter and Instagram. Uh, they should pretty easy to find. Uh, if, if you put with Australasian paleontology, you should find them in the research the search uh, fields. So that's our Twitter page here. And if you want to Twitter or Facebook today, uh, you can use those uh, hashtags uh, for today. Uh, and before I, I, I move on to the next speaker, um, later on we're going to have a discussion uh, about uh, the future of AAP. Uh, and I want to give you a few points to think about before uh, that discussion. So first thing is we want to introduce new awards uh, to actually um, get people interested again with in, in this society. So we'll mention those uh, afterwards, but we really want to have uh, two new awards, one for students and one for middle career researchers, because that's what was missing in our current awards. Uh, we want to actually start building the community. So this symposium is really a community building. So we're getting all of WA together. And we have uh, one in South Australia uh, next month, 27th of April. And there'll be some in Sydney, Melbourne, and Brisbane as well. And we've got people actually organizing these those. Um, so they will be also uh, on Facebook uh, live stream, so you'll be able to watch them uh, live as well. I know. I'm just doing the time check. I know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we also join um, taxonomic. This is the last slide, so I'm, I'm finishing it. Uh, uh, we're going to. Um, uh, we just joined Taxonomy Australia uh, because Taxonomy Australia is trying to promote taxonomy to the uh, broad community. And one thing that people don't realize is that paleontologists do a lot of taxonomy as well. And if you visit the Taxonomy Australia website uh, that's live, it, was, it came out this, you know, last week, uh, there's no paleontology at all at this stage. So we've been invited to join in so we can actually start building a, a paleo taxonomy Australia really within it. Uh, another thing we want to do is to uh, mention is linking maybe with other conferences like CAVEPS. And we need help probably some from uh, volunteers because there's four of us in the community. We can't do everything because we're, we're all busy with our actual jobs. Um, if you want, you're interested in, in helping it out, uh, put your name down on the volunteer list here. Uh, I need your time today uh, so uh, then we can actually start a, a uh, uh, some communication and see what we can uh, do. <coughs> but we'll talk more about it during the discussion. So that's all from me now, and we're going to move on to our first talk. Um, so we'll start the.